Our next speaker is Dr. John Druyer, and I know him quite well because he is the retinal specialist I see regularly for checkups for my macular degeneration. On the occasions when I've needed an injection in my eye to treat the disease, I am always thankful both for his knowledge and his steady, sure hands. You have to have a lot of trust in a person doing that, and I have that in him. He and his wife, Dr. Okamura, uh, who is a proud alumni of JAPSOM, they are also great supporters of JAPSOM as well, so I meet them often at JAPSOM events. So please welcome John. Okay, well, good morning, and thank you, Dr. Henshaw, and everyone here. Um, just as a uh, disclaimer, the photos are mine, the talk is the American Academy of Ophthalmology. And for those of you who are lucky to get that little white thing that I handed out, those are not eyeballs. <laughs> they are metaphors for rotten eggs and tomatoes in case I get off track. So. <laughs> And I chose ping pong balls because they can't throw very hard or very far. <laughs> okay, so in my office, uh, and as I get older, you know, I have to say in a very soft way, I'm sorry, but this is happening because of the aging process. So I've learned to say, you're getting wiser and more mature. <laughs> and so that's why this, this topic like this. I spent a long time trying to figure out what to present in this talk. And this is a selfie. Um, <laughs> Rusty's Rush, a good friend of mine. But anyway, um, just to start a little bit in terms of how the eye works and how it functions. The eye is like a miniature camera. It's about an inch in diameter in most people. It's pretty small, but it has uh, an amazing way of taking care of us and helping us get through the world. The, whatever you look at out here comes in into the eyeball like this. The front part is called the cornea. It's the front clear uh, tissue. It's like a dome over the front of the eye. And then, if I can get this to work, there's the iris. That's the colored part of the eye. It can be blue or brown or green or hazel or whatever. There's a hole in the middle here called the pupil. That allows the light coming into the eye to get into the back of the eye. The cornea and the lens in the eye help focus the picture on the retina. The retina is the inside lining of the eye. So if you have a set of mixing bowls, just imagine the inside mixing bowl is the retina. And then the retina processes the picture and sends a picture through the nerve to the brain so the brain knows what the eyeball is looking at. The retina, interestingly, has one small area called the macula, which is less than a sixteenth of an inch in diameter. And this is what we use for our fine detailed vision. Reading, watching TV, driving, recognizing people's faces. All the rest of the retina, all the rest of this inside here, is for our sight vision and night vision. So the reason I'm making this emphasis on this structure is because the macula is terribly important to our daily living activities so that we can get through life and have a good time. So we're going to talk first about age-related macular degeneration. There are many types of macular degeneration, but in general, age-related is defined as problems with the macula of a certain type when you're 50 years and over. So, again, you have the macula and you have the peripheral retina. The macula is responsible for the reading vision, as you see in this photo. So the question is, what is macular degeneration? Macular degeneration starts off with problems actually under the retina. There's an accumulation of uh, waste products called drusen, and these accumulate around the reading vision area, around the macula, and initially, they may not cause any trouble to vision, but as time goes along, if the deposits get enough, if they get abundant enough, then we start having trouble with blurring of vision and our distortion of vision. So again, early macular degeneration, it's not a big deal. It's only when it gets to be a little bit further along. You may develop dark areas in the central part of your vision that you can't see around, 
um, straight lines may look crooked. If you look at that picture up there at the clock, if you look directly at the black center, you can still see the numbers on the clock. They're just not as clear. So when you're looking at the black center, that's what you're doing when you're looking at the macula. If you look at a specific number, like the one, you're using your macula to look at that. So people with macular degeneration oftentimes will look just off to the side in order to use the part of the retina that they see better with. There are two types of macular degeneration. One is called the dry type, and then you have the wet type. With the dry type, this is basically wear and tear in the back of the eye, just like our muscles get a little bit weaker and everything gets a little bit weaker. Um, as you look at the inside of the eye, you see these little yellow spots here. Normally, the macula, which is located here, this is a picture of the inside of a person's eye with macular degeneration. This is where the nerve enters the back of the eye. So the macula here picks up the fine detail reading vision. And once you start developing these little yellow spots, this is when macular degeneration starts. These little yellow spots are called drusen, and they represent waste products accumulating under the retina. With wet macular degeneration, it's not a wear and tear thing. You've already gone through that phase. But with wet macular degeneration, you start developing abnormal blood vessels growing under the retina. Unfortunately, these blood vessels are very fragile, they're very weak, and they start leaking the fluid that carries the blood, and then in some cases they can actually start bleeding. And this is when vision loss may be more rapid or much more profound. So with seeing patients with macular degeneration, we have several tests that we can do. One is called angiography. We do this in our office. We inject a medicine into a vein, and we take pictures of the medicine as it flows through the back of the eye. The other test that's come along in more recent years is called optical coherence tomography, and this has revolutionized the way ophthalmologists in general practice their, their uh, profession. With optical coherence tomography, this is a normal person. This is the nerve as it enters the back of the eye. This is the macula. Where this green line is, the machine takes a cross-section of the retina, that's what you see here, and this is what a normal macula looks like. Normally there's a little dip here. This is dead center reading vision, the 20-20 vision area right here. So with this test, we can actually see all the layers, all the nine layers of the retina. It's, it's an incredible uh, advance for us to help us with uh, patient care. In terms of treatment of these things, so we've talked about what is macular degeneration? We've talked about there are two types of it, dry and wet. We've talked about how we diagnose it. It's basically with an eye exam and secondly with ancillary testing. And we're going to talk about treating macular degeneration. For a dry macular degeneration, at the best we have right now are supplements, basically specific vitamins and mineral supplements. Vitamin C, vitamin E, zinc, copper, lutein, and zeaxanthin. The reason you see copper here is because if you take zinc alone, people can develop what's called a copper deficiency anemia. So this is to try to prevent that. The lutein and the zeaxanthin are carotenoids, uh, similar to vitamin A. And these give people with dry macular degeneration about a 20% better chance of not advancing to a severe form of macular degeneration. Dry macular degeneration does have a severe form in which people can lose their reading vision. However, most patients who lose their reading vision do so from wet macular degeneration. So if a patient comes in with macular degeneration, I can tell them early on, I can tell them there's an 85% chance that they will have reasonably good vision all their life. There's about a 15% chance that they can have significant reading vision problems as they grow older. In that 15%, 3% is from an advanced form of dry macular degeneration, and 12% is from the wet macular degeneration. And Dr. Nichols, I forgot the rest of my talk. Can you help me? <laughs> <laughs> Gee, this, this is it's tough following this guy. Gee, he made Christmas. Okay. So for, for the wet type of macular degeneration, through the decades, we've evolved many treatments. The most current one is 
really like a modern miracle for taking care of patients. We now have what's called anti-vascular endothelial growth factor drugs, which we treat patients with. It's called anti-VEGF. So if a patient with wet macular degeneration comes in, I can give them a 90% chance, a 9 out of 10 chance, that we can stabilize their vision and keep them from losing more vision in that eye. That is incredible, because the best we could do before was about 50 to 60% with treatments that we thought were wonderful when they came out, but they really didn't pan out too well. The medicine we inject in the eye binds a chemical that promotes growth of these abnormal blood vessels. And unfortunately, it's like any medicine, like if I'm a diabetic or if I have hypertension. If I quit taking my medicine, the problem comes back. This medicine we inject in the eye only lasts a certain period of time, and then the abnormal blood vessels start coming back. So for most patients, this tends to be a chronic procedure of coming into the office monthly, either being examined and getting an injection, or being examined, if everything's okay, you go home for another month, and then you come back again. Statistically, from the research basis, people do better if they come in for monthly exams, even though that's a huge burden for the patient. The three drugs we have available are Avastin. It's used off-label. It's much less expensive. Works incredibly well. First advanced by Phil Rosenfeld in Miami. Lucentis and ILA are both FDA approved, much more expensive, work very well. All three drugs are used interchangeably. It depends upon what works for that particular patient. So we do the injections in the office, and unfortunately some days if I'm like this, I can't do them. So then I do like this, and then I do like this. So it, it works. Um, <laughs> you should see me operate. <laughs> um, so we try, all the docs that are doing this therapy, really try to minimize it for the patient. If a patient has to have them every month, we do it. If they don't need them every month, we really try to extend the time between injections. There are potential complications from the injections both for the body as well as for the eye. And unfortunately, that's what's needed to be accepted in order to save your vision. This is an example of a patient. You can, let me get this thing to work. You can see this big bump under the retina here. This is a picture of the inside of the eye. The white vessels mean that there's dye in the vessels from the testing we're doing. This bump represents fluid leakage under the retina. The patient came in with about 2,100 vision. They receive the injections, and the eye came down to a more normal state. These little bumps you see under the retina, those are the drusen from the age-related dry part that the patient started with. Not everyone has this dramatic a result, but these drugs are miracle workers, and they are very expensive. In my office, I, I purchase over $1.7 million of drugs a year to give to patients. We have to purchase them first, and then we hope the insurance company reimburses us, because these are expensive drugs. So if you've been diagnosed with macular degeneration, be sure you're monitoring your vision every day with a thing called an Amdra chart. There are various ways of doing this. If you don't have a chart, my goodness, there are door frames over there, and you can look at the horizontal and the vertical, and you can see whether or not they're wavy. There are all sorts of ways of checking your vision, but the point is you check each eye separately because if you have a strongly dominant eye and you're using both eyes together, you'll never know if something's wrong with the other eye. If it can't be treated, patients will lose their central vision, their reading vision. Today, there are more modern technological devices. Uh, there's one that one of my patients is using now. It's incredible. That patient has 2,400 vision, and the patient's able to read 2020 vision lines and they're able to do their business, and they're able to see TV. They can't walk around with this device on, but it's made a huge difference in their life. So I'm using the photographs to break up the topics. We're going to go on to another topic now. <laughs> and this, this little Evie is telling me I better hurry up. So we're going to talk about diabetes and diabetic retinopathy. Again, talking about the healthy eye. Again, the retina is the inside lining of the eye. The retina gets its nutrition from blood vessels, and these blood vessels are what get damaged with diabetes. Um, diabetes has many effects on the eye. It makes people have cataracts earlier in life than they would otherwise. 
It can produce different types of glaucoma, and it can cause diabetic retinopathy, which is damage to the blood vessels in the retina. Just like with macular degeneration, there are different types or, or uh, forms of diabetic retinopathy. The first type that we usually see is called non-proliferative, which means the blood vessels that are normally in the retina become damaged. The second type is proliferative retinopathy, which is a later stage, and that means that you're growing abnormal new blood vessels in the retina. Non-proliferative, some of the older terms are background diabetic retinopathy. Again, it has to do with damaged blood vessels. And with the damaged blood vessels, again, this is a picture of a normal-looking person, optic nerve, macula, retinal blood vessels. This is a person with diabetes. You can see these little red spots. There are hemorrhages in the back of the eye. And the yellow spots represent deposition of proteins, lipids, and so forth that are leaking outside the blood vessel wall into the retinal tissue. When you get leakage like this, if you think of a sponge, when a sponge is dry, it's dry, it's relatively flat. But if you put water on it or milk or some liquid, it'll swell. And that's what happens to the retina. If the swelling occurs in the macula, this causes blurring or loss of reading vision. This is called macular edema. It's the most common form of vision loss in diabetic retinopathy. And this can be mild initially or it can be quite severe. For many, many years, we used laser to treat this. We still use laser. We're now using the anti-vascular endothelial growth factor drugs quite successfully with most of the patients. And in some patients, we have to revert also to steroid injections. So again, we have a way of dealing with this. Proliferative diabetic retinopathy, which is a later form of the disease, what happens with this, diabetes causes the small blood vessels in the body to shut down, to close off. That's why you hear about diabetics having amputations of their toes and their feet and their legs and so forth. The same thing happens in the eye. The little blood vessels in the retina start closing down. So then the eye makes a chemical that stimulates the growth of these blood vessels even more. And that's where, again, these drugs we inject come into hand. With proliferative retinopathy, this is a normal person here. Down here you may notice this little fine filigree of blood vessels like little silver filigree in here. That's different than these larger blood vessels. These little fine blood vessels, again, are the abnormal new blood vessels that are very fragile. They frequently bleed. They eventually form scar tissue. And once they start bleeding, then you get bleeding into the cavity of the eye. So if you think of a glass of water, you can see through it. If you start adding milk to that water, it's harder to see through it. The more you have bleeding into the cavity of the eye, the harder it is to see. This is an example of someone who's bled in the eye, and this white stuff represents scarring that goes along with the abnormal blood vessel growth. When a patient comes in with bleeding in the eye and we can't see in the eye, we can do testing to see how bad it is, essentially. Um, the question is, at what point when you have diabetes do you get checked so that you can try to avoid these issues? If you're getting diabetes when you're young and you're insulin dependent and you're 30 years or younger, then getting a check within five years is the right thing to do. If you're getting diabetes as an adult, you need an exam from the time of diagnosis and at least yearly thereafter. Uh, with eye exams, we do the basic eye exam. If you have something of significance going on with a diabetic retinopathy, again, we do angiography. This helps us, it, it acts like a roadmap to help us know if we need to do laser surgery or if we need to do injections. Now, if a patient's bled already and they can't see out of the eye and we can't see into the eye properly because the blood's blocking our view, we can do an ultrasound test to see whether or not the retina's attached. Frequently, if a patient bleeds in the eye, the bleeding will get better on its own as long as they don't bleed anymore. If it doesn't get better, we can do surgery to remove the blood in the eye. Again, getting back to what's the best way to take care of this? Excellent blood sugar, blood pressure, and cholesterol control. So we rely on the anti-VEGF drugs. We rely on steroids that can be injected in the eye in liquid form or pellet form. The pellets are uh, slow release, long acting. 
The only downside is that people see this little pellet floating around in their vision from time to time. But with the injections, this is a patient with a lot of swelling of the retina. These dark areas represent hemorrhages. Some of this is loss of blood supply. And after injections, we can, in many cases, get back normal contour of the retina and better vision. So this patient may have 2100 vision, and we may be able to recover 2025 to 2030 vision. Again, these drugs have been a real miracle worker for many types of retinal vascular disease. Vitrectomy means we remove the hemorrhagic vitreous gel. When there's bleeding into the cavity of the eye, the cavity of the eye is over with a gel-like substance called vitreous, and then we have surgery in which we can remove the blood in the gel. This is just an example of bleeding within the cavity of the eye. We make little holes in the front of the eye. We put our instruments into the eye. This is all done through microsurgical work, and we do the best to get vision back to the patient. Again, excellent care of yourself helps prevent a lot of these complications. This is another friend saying, God, I hope you all are learning something. <laughs> okay. People frequently get sent in with floaters or flashing lights. And the question is, does it mean anything? Fortunately for most of us, it's just another part of maturity and wisdom. For a few people, it does mean something. Um, what are floaters? Well, basically, the, the inside cavity of the eye is sort of this gel-like substance. It's not a pure gel. It's a matrix of thick fluid and collagen fibrils. And so when the gel starts aging, it degenerates, and the collagen fibrils become more prominent. And that's when you start seeing these little floater-type things. And because if you, if you have a bowl of jello that's partially liquefied and you shake the bowl of jello, the gel will move around. The same is true with the gel in the eye. The more you move your eye around, the more you see the floaters moving around. So as we get older, now I had my first floater in my right eye when I was 24 years of age. Most people don't have floaters when they're 24. But if you're really myopic, if you're really nearsighted, you get them earlier in life. But also, as we age, the vitreous gel starts liquefying more, and the part that remains in gel form shrinks, and it basically pulls away from the back of the eye. So this represents the gel that's partially pulled away from the retina. And this is when we start seeing more and more floaters, because the little collagen fibrils are in this area here, the gel that's closest to the retina. Now sometimes, I'm going to go back a little bit, maybe... Sometimes, when the gel pulls away from the retina, these blood vessels are on the surface of the retina, so they can pull on the blood vessel and they can bleed. Sometimes, when the gel pulls away from the retina, it pulls hard enough to tear the retina, and then the liquefied gel goes through this hole and starts causing a retinal detachment. So if a person calls our office and says, I have a lot of floaters all of a sudden, we'll say, come on in, let's look at you. And the reason is, number one, we may need to make sure they're okay or not. Number two, if they've developed a tear in the retina, it's a lot easier to laser the tear and seal it down than to let the retinal detachment occur and take them to surgery and try to fix them that way. So if all of a sudden you get a lot of new floaters or flashing lights, get it checked out as soon as feasible. I have a lot of complaints about patients having floaters. I've had, in my practice time, two or three patients actually requiring psychiatric help because the floaters bother them so much. Um, and so all of us react to health and illness in different ways. Uh, but basically, when you start getting flashing lights, that means that the gel is pulling hard enough on the retina to stimulate it. To me, that's a little bit more of a problem than just floaters, because if you're getting flashing lights, that means I have to be more concerned about is there a tear that's happened or going to happen. So when the vitreous detaches from the retina, it's called a posterior vitreous detachment. The floaters will be with you really for the rest of your life. They're more noticeable if you're looking at a white background or the sky or something that's a solid color, a lighter color. The flashing lights generally diminish with time. It may take weeks to months. Occasional patients, they never totally go away. Um, but just be aware that, yes, they're, either, they're livable with, but make sure that if you get a lot of new ones, you get it checked out. 
trauma. We hear about retinal detachments, and everyone thinks about trauma. Actually, trauma is the least, uh, is, it, trauma is less likely to cause retinal detachments than the natural aging process. Now, we've seen problems, I've seen problems from baseball and golf. I haven't seen anything from field hockey out here, or ice hockey. Um, I've taken care of a lot of uh, firecracker injuries. I've taken care of people driving down the street and a rock comes up from a passing car and takes out their left eye. So when you're driving, either wear your glasses or have the window up. Um, we see a lot of freak things. And so the, the caution comes from just being aware of what you're around. If you're hammering a nail, bits of metal fly off the nail, they go into the eyeball. I've taken care of a lot of those patients. Uh, if you're drilling, guess what? Something explodes, the drill bit explodes. If someone's mowing the yard next door and they hit something and it flies out, or they're using a weed whacker, things happen. So just be aware of what's going on around you. So that's flashes and floaters. This is called a selfie. Now, this is like asking, where is Waldo? If you can find me, I'll give you a dollar. Um, if any of you have seen Cloudgate, uh, commonly known as the Bean in Chicago, this is under what the underneath side looks like. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about glaucoma. And Mrs. Yim is in the audience. Her son is a glaucoma specialist, new to town, doing a good job. Um, glaucoma also has many varieties. It can occur when you're young, it can occur more so when you're older. Glaucoma means for most patients that the, the, the eye has a eye pressure. It's different than blood pressure. And the eye pressure in all of us tends to have a normal range, but if it gets too high, then the eye pressure can cause damage to the optic nerve. And it's like if you're having a TV cable and you cut off cut out part of the cable, then you're not going to get the whole picture. And that's what happens with glaucoma. So glaucoma is a disease of the optic nerve. It's not totally related to eye pressure. We think that there's also a, what's called a neuropathy that goes with it, which means the optic nerve doesn't work as well anymore. Glaucoma is one of the leading causes of blindness in our country. Uh, at first, you don't know you have it until you start losing vision. It's been called the silent blinder, like hypertension has been called the silent killer. Um, early detection is really key to keeping good vision all your life. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about how this works. If you look at a cross-section of the front of the eye, again, this is the cornea. This is a, this, remember, the cornea is like a, a dome over the front of the eye. This is the iris. This area here is, over, is a space, it's filled with fluid. The fluid is called aqueous humor. It's made in this part of the eye, this is called the ciliary body. It traverses between the iris and the natural lens through the pupil, out drainage channels in the front part of the eye, right where the cornea meets the sclera. So with glaucoma, this fluid, the aqueous humor, doesn't flow out as well as it should because of problems with the outflow channels. And over time, the eye pressure increases. And that's called open angle glaucoma. It's the most common form of glaucoma. Second type of glaucoma is called closed angle glaucoma. It's less common, but it's much more emergent in terms of taking care of the patient for saving vision. There are many other types of glaucoma, but these are the two most common ones we see. So with open angle glaucoma, the drainage channels, called the trabecular meshwork, become less efficient at draining of the fluid that's made in the eye. So if you think of a closed container and you have a hose going into it, and you just have a little bit of, hose, of water going in and there's a little bit of hole on the other side for water to get out, that's great. But if the hole on the other side starts closing off, the water's still going in, then the pressure inside builds up. And that's what happens with open angle glaucoma. Typically, again, glaucoma doesn't have symptoms early on um, with open angle glaucoma. The other type is angle closure glaucoma. And with this, the space between the cornea and the iris is very narrow. And therefore, fluid that's made back here 
can't go through the people and out through these strange channels like it normally does. So the pressure builds up very quickly. With angle closure glaucoma, there's an acute type and a chronic type. If you, if you talk to an eye doctor, we've got all these variety of things. And it's like looking at a car. You have a lot of things to choose from. With closed angle glaucoma with the acute type, patients will present with eye pain, headache. They may see halos around lights that they don't normally see. Um, they may have nausea and vomiting, and their blood pressure may be really high. Those people require emergency surgery. These days we're using lasers in order to fix that patient. We'll go into that in a little bit. In general, the risk factors for developing glaucoma, just like with macular degeneration, are age, but also family history. That's true with macular degeneration. <clears throat> uh, elevation of your eye pressure. People who are very nearsighted or very farsighted have a greater tendency to get glaucoma. People of a certain racial or ethnic uh, backgrounds are more likely to get glaucoma. Diabetes, previous eye injuries, um, a thin cornea. Uh, a thin, we're all built differently. The cornea, the front clear part of the eye has a certain thickness to it. So if you have a thin cornea, most of the time the pressure measures perfectly in our office, but in, in reality the eye pressure is higher than that because with a thin cornea, our instruments don't do a good job at measuring it. So we now have algorithms to interpret thickness of the cornea versus eye pressure in terms of what's the real eye pressure in the eye. Sometimes low blood pressure can cause poor blood supply of the optic nerve and cause glaucoma problems. So we all think, well, let's go to the screening and let's get our eye pressure checked and we'll be okay. Well, the problem is with glaucoma, Eye pressure is only part of the picture. So to really get checked for glaucoma, you need to see your eye doctor. They need to do your eye pressure. They need to do an eye exam and actually look at the optic nerve. And in some cases, they need to do other types of testing also. So tonometry means checking the eye pressure. Um, in this picture, you can barely see it, but there's a little device here with a blue light on it. This touches the front of the eye. We put anesthetic on the eye. There are different machines to take eye pressure. Um, we look at the optic nerve. Subtle changes may reveal early changes in glaucoma. This is a normal looking optic nerve. There's a little lighter area here called the optic cup. This is a patient who's had severe damage with loss of nerve tissue. This big, larger, lighter area is loss of nerve tissue compared to over here. This patient has visual field loss, which means that they're not seeing everything out here. So a visual field is a test in which you look into this, basically this white hemisphere, and little lights come on, and you press a button when the lights come on. And if any of you have had this test, you know that it's not easy. I've had this test to see what it's like. It kind of drove me bonkers. <laughs> My wife says I'm that way anyway, so <laughs> I don't know. Um, but in this case, you can see this is a normal visual field. This dark area is where the optic nerve enters the eye. That's an area that we do not see. And this patient has loss of visual field where it's darker here. So this patient has glaucoma damage already. So in other words, what I'm saying is it's not a simple eye screening test with an eye pressure, but it's a full-on eye exam to test for glaucoma. And then again, treatment depends upon the type and severity of the glaucoma, and also how the, re how the glaucoma responds to treatment. Just like with blood pressure, your doctor may start off with one medicine, but if you don't respond, then he changes it, he increases the the strength of it, or it puts you on an additional medicine and so forth. With open angle glaucoma, most of the time uh, it's treated with eye drops. The vast majority of patients simply need eye drops once or twice, so three times a day. We know that the more frequently you have to take a pill or a drop during the day, the less likely you are to do it. And so they're really trying to develop medicines that you use, eye drops that you use once a day. But we just are not there yet. There's still drops you have to use two or three or even four times a day, and that means that compliance, the patient's ability to do this, drops. If the compliance is really low or if the drops aren't working, then various laser procedures can be done to try to lower and control the eye pressure. If that doesn't work, then there are various surgical procedures that can be done to lower the eye pressure. 
This is an example of one of them. It's called a trabeculectomy. And basically what the surgeon is doing here is making an extra outflow channel out of the eye so that fluid can get out of the eye in an easier way. And this works pretty well. Again, as with any surgery, there are potential problems with it. So most ophthalmologists prefer using either drops or laser before going to cutting surgery. On the other hand, the closed angle glaucoma, that's the type that's more of an emergency to save vision. We used to have to take the patient to the emergency room, I mean to the operating room, and cut a little hole in the iris. As of 1982, we now have a laser device that actually blows a hole in the iris as an outpatient, and it works, and it's slick, and it's nice, and it saves you cutting surgery. There are other forms of angle closure glaucoma in which that may still need surgery, but this is the mainstay for treating the acute type of angle closure glaucoma. So in most patients, glaucoma is controllable. There are a few patients in which it's really, really hard to control it, and they get many operations, and it's still difficult to control it. Um, but if you have a family history of it, uh, if you're extremely nearsighted, if you're very farsighted, you know, be sure you're seeing your eye doctor uh, on a regular basis. And this is my little friend. He's saying, it's time for lunch. Will you please hurry up? <laughs> okay. So the last thing I'm going to talk about is cataracts. Um, it seems that if we live long enough, we all get them. Again, looking at a model of the eye, the natural lens in the eye is supposed to be clear, like your eyeglasses. With time, the natural lens starts turning cloudy. So with time, if you think about putting frosting on a window pane, if you put more and more frosting on the window pane, it's harder to see through the window pane. And that's what a cataract does. Um, going back a little bit, I'm sorry. The cornea and the lens focus the picture on the retina. So if the lens is cloudy, you can't get a good focus. And we're going to show you something about that later. So this is a normal lens, healthy lens, and this is a lens that someone is turning cloudy, and in many cases it turns sort of a brownish color, and that's why when you look at things, although you don't know it because it's been a slow process, things don't have the right color to them. So in a normal eye, whatever you look at gets focused nicely on the macula. In an eye with a cataract, the lens in the eye spreads out the focusing so that you don't get a good focus. So this is, presents with blurring of vision. You may go in thinking, well, you need an eyeglass change, and the doctor says, oh, I don't think so. It's, you're getting a cataract. You get more glare and light sensitivity, especially with driving at night with oncoming headlights. Um, occasionally, we can get double vision in a, from a cataract on a one-eye basis. It's very common that you need a brighter light to read, but that's also true with macular degeneration. And then because the lens can turn yellow in some of the cataracts, that's when things start having a sepia tone to them. So aging is the most common cause of it. Family history. People can be born with cataracts. Diabetes causes cataracts to grow quicker. Injuries to the eye causes cataracts. Uh, medications, especially steroids, makes cataracts grow quicker. Um, people who work in the sun a lot, fishermen, farmers, they get cataracts earlier. Um, previous eye surgery, for instance, the vitrectomy surgery that I do, we know that that's going to make a cataract get worse quicker. Unfortunately, we don't have a good way of taking care of cataracts other than changing your eyeglasses as long as that will work or operating to remove the cataract. You may hear of drops that are used to fix cataracts. Um, by and large, I'm not sure that that has any validity. Sometimes simply changing your eyeglass can keep up with the... As, as a cataract grows, it, it changes how the light is focused in the eye. So sometimes changing an eyeglass can change where that focus is in the eye. So changing the glass can be helpful. And what a question I get frequently, um, either from my own patients or patients seen in consultation is, when should I get my cataract done? And this is a very personal thing. I have patients with 2400 vision who are happy 
and they don't want cataract surgery. I have patients with 20-25 vision who are terribly unhappy and they can't wait to get their cataract surgery. So it depends upon your needs, your daily functions, and also how you cope with blurry vision. So it depends on how you're doing your job, if you're still working, whether you can drive safely or even drive legally at all. And quite frankly, that's a real point with some of my patients. They can't see well enough to pass their driver's test. They're forced to get their cataract surgery if they want to continue driving legally. Um, so this is a decision that's mostly driven by you. Occasionally a cataract gets so advanced that it causes medical trouble to the eye, and that's when we get involved and we say, you have to have this done or you're going to lose your eye. That doesn't happen much in this country, but it still is seen. And then the other time is if the cataract is advanced enough that we can't see well enough to look in the back of the eye, we'll tell patients, please get your cataract done so we can take care of you properly. Now, you've all heard, I mean, you see on TV all the time all these advertisements for cataract surgery. There are many ways to do it. Today, they all work well. Um, it just depends upon how you want your cataract done, what type of lens implant you want, um, and also if you want premium work done, how much you're willing to pay out of pocket for it. Um, insurance covers it up to a point. But basically, to do the cataract, you have to get into the eyeball. So whether you use a laser or a knife, you're still cutting into the eye. And you use a small instrument, it's called a phaco emulsification instrument, and basically it acts like a jackhammer to break up the cloudy cataract and suck it out of the eye. Now, the natural lens in the eye is like a grape. It has a clear skin around it. A grape has a skin around it, and it's got the contents that we enjoy eating. The natural lens in the eye has a clear capsule, like a clear cellophane bag around the contents of the lens. The contents is what turns cloudy. So at surgery, the cataract surgeon makes a little hole in the capsule and the covering over the lens that allows him to put his instrument in to take out the cloudy contents. And then in that clear bag that's left in the eye, he puts a lens implant in the eye. So this is the part of the lens implant that has the power to let you see. And this is the part of the lens implant, it's called the haptic, that keeps the lens implant held in position in that clear bag. And about half the patients over time after cataract surgery, that clear bag starts to cloud over. So the back of the bag is cloudy and then the patient gets blurry vision again. And then we can, again, we can do a laser to put a hole in that bag to clear it up. So this is a cloudy capsule behind the lens implant we can use a laser, it literally blasts a hole in there, it causes a plasma explosion, and the capsule breaks open and allows you to see better. It's like punching a hole in a cloudy windowpane. Cataract surgery is one of the most frequently done operations in the country. It, um, I can tell you that most patients will have an excellent result if you don't have anything else wrong with the eye, then there's a 95% chance you will see better afterwards. Yes, it's major eye surgery still. No matter how much they tell you it's simple, it ain't simple. What's simple is what you go through. You're all old enough to remember your parents having cataract surgery in which they were in bed for six weeks with sandbags on either side of the head until the eye healed. With modern day cataract surgery, you're almost at full steam again the next day. The only thing they ask is that you don't rub your eye and you keep it clean and dry for a week or so until the incision heals up. So it's, it's really a wonderful thing that's happened over the years in terms of advances in technique of doing cataract surgery that allows you to get back to your life. I'd like for you to consider on the economics of this, no matter what the surgery itself costs, what's the social cost of cataract surgery 30 years ago being out of work for six weeks versus today going back to work the next day. That's huge, but that's not figured into medical economics when they talk about how much we are costing you guys. <laughs> so, so please understand there are trade-offs. We can have much cheaper medicine in this country. I'd like to see a show of hands. How many of you are willing to go back to medicine 30 years ago? <laughs> how many of you are willing to say this is worth it? Okay, so you have, you have to kind of decide for yourself, what's all this worth? 
It's just like buying a car. What's it worth to you? Okay, so again, um, cataract surgery for most patients is elective, which means it's by your choice. You determine when you think it's necessary. However, the other kicker here is insurance also rules your life and my life, and they won't let you get paid for it by them if your vision is not bad enough. So you may have bad vision by your standards, but not bad vision by insurance standards. And if you want cataract surgery again, it's going to be a personal pay situation. The nice thing in our country is it's a free country, and we can pay for almost anything we want. <laughs> you just have to be willing to do it. <laughs> Okay, so the whole purpose of this talk is to give a sort of a brief overview of the major things that affect us all as we get older so that we can keep enjoying the beauty of life. And that's what I got. Yay. Thank you. Thank you.